So yeah, getting this thing started, would you be able to give us a little bit about what you do and what your work is all about? Happily, Gary, and my work is all about focusing on two things. One is releasing stress, because if we're stressed, it interferes with everything else we do. Um, there are parts of the brain that are highly active in stressed people, and they're the parts of the brain that essentially handle our responses to threats. And while we're stressed, we're scanning the horizon for threats. About 60% of the machinery in our brain, the neurons in our brain, are devoted to discovering opportunities and avoiding threats. And so we're we're highly attuned to this in our evolution, and it's created a brain that makes us really aware of what's wrong. And in a an archaic environment, when there were um, all kinds of problems that we had to solve, you know, during the ice ages and during the course of evolution, when there were predators all all around. We needed that equipment. Now we have all this neural hardware and virtually no objective threats to us, our survival. So what we do is we worry, and that is driving up our cortisol. It shortens our lives. Stressed people live dramatically shorter lives with a lot more disease than those that aren't stressed. And so one of my primary objectives is to, how can we get off that hamster wheel of looking for the things that are wrong in our environment. And then the next next thing I focus on, so about for about 25 years, I was very focused on research into PTSD. I did over 100 clinical trials with various groups, refugees, veterans, victims of abuse, various other people who had high levels of traumatic stress. And we worked out a protocol that is able to release that stress in between four and 10 one-hour sessions. So that was the the big initial thing that I focused on. And then I turned my attention to what happens when you aren't stressed. And that's where the fun begins, because that's when you're able to turn your attention to things that really enrich your life, like meditation, like spiritual intelligence, like growth, like developing your potential. So my last batch of research over the last five or 10 years has been focused on transcendent states. When we move into a letting go of our worry, of our stress, of our focus on our little ordinary lives, and we meditate, and then we develop a relationship with something larger than ourselves, what happens then? And what happens then is all kinds of (laughs) fabulous, interesting things. So that's what I do. Awesome. Wow. So essentially, it's deprogramming, and then reprogramming, and uh, then like you said, the fun starts? That's where the fun starts. And mm. we have capacities, we have potential that is immensely greater than we realize. Most of us are living very cramped lives in a tiny subset of our potential. And what's just thrilling is to watch, say, for example, someone who, a veteran, who has been living with fear, reactivity, with hypervigilance, with avoidance, with all of the characteristics of PTSD, haunted by flashbacks and nightmares. Like one one young man I worked with, he um, had been just incredibly stressed since he served in Iraq. He served four tours of duty in Iraq. He had terrible experiences there, firefights. He was a medic. A lot of his friends were killed in Iraq, and he came back with with many events in his, his mind, um, <clears throat> cleaning the, the uniforms of, of soldiers who, who had died, and sent them back to their next of kin, uh, people he'd known being shot, just nightmares. And then seeing him just release that burden of stress, he went on to become a psychiatrist, work at Walter Reed Hospital, wow. and then serve other other veterans. That was his his potential. And so you, you see that happen, and it makes a huge difference in people's lives. And then when they do that, where do they go next? What potential do they have? And if he had stayed stressed, his world would have been very small, very limited, and it would have shrunk over time. Uh, People with PTSD, actually, their symptoms often worsen as they age. But people who are able to escape the burden of traumatic stress, they are able to thrive and flourish. And then what do they do? They help other people. Um, they, They... have parts of their brain come online that are to do with creativity and resilience and joy and gratitude 
And that's, again, when the full potential that they are starts to express itself. So that's really what we have to do. We have to do both those things, both release our the the enormous amount of our attention and brain function that is bound up with stress and then find out who we are. I mean, we came here to be glorious expressions of the divine, of, of the infinite intelligence that is the universe of consciousness itself. Read the great classics of the Upanishads or the Vedas, uh, Christian mysticism, and these mystics, Meister Eckhart, and all of these great, great figures, Hildegard of Bingen, St. Francis, they talk about this connection with the infinite that we as human bodies and minds and hearts are meant to express, live that kind of a life. And um, <laughs> that's the fun. <laughs> part of this huge wave of transformation. So that that's, yeah, that's where yeah. it's at. Amazing. Now, would you be able to give us a synopsis of what this process looks like? Yes, you have to do both those things. I, when I was um, a teenager many decades ago, 50, 60 years ago plus, I, I, was, I was a classic poster child for PTSD. Traumatic childhood, wound up suicidal and, and disconnected from society at 13, 14, had no friends. And then one day I was laying on my bed at home, just completely despairing and not wanting to live another day. And I suddenly find myself having this mystical experience of floating in the universe and looking around me and like seeing all the stars. I was out there in the middle of the universe, just untethered to any known reality. And I felt the fabric of consciousness itself. And it was love. It was love. It was nurturing. It was supportive. And That's suddenly it. I knew that there was something far beyond the miserable, suicidal, traumatic, stressed place that I lived from every day. And I then joined a spiritual community. I then studied psychology. I got into book publishing. I did a whole had a whole career in in that field. And so um, I began to explore all those elements of human potential. And what you have to do is those experiences are wonderful but then moving in them into integration with everyday life that took me another 30 40 years because we we have these peak experiences which the sufis call glimpses of heaven so we have these glimpses are the these transcendent states when you hold the baby when you see the grand canyon when you stand and watch a sunset and these are inbuilt into our brains macabre monkeys monkeys who are uh, suddenly bathed in the glow of a beautiful sunset, literally stop whatever they're doing and stare. I mean, we're as mm. mammals, we are able to have experiences of awe and, and bliss. And that that lights up parts of our brain that we all have. And so we have these parts of our brain, the 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 challenge that is to bring them on on steam on a regular basis. And so meditation does that. Effective forms of meditation allow us to enter those states of connection with the, the invisible, the real. And so that's where we find the sense of connection. And in this absolutely mystical union that the great saints and sages and masters talk about, we lose our clinging to individual local consciousness and we become one with the all it is. In indivisible, infinite, non-local, eternal consciousness. And that's that interface that the human brain is able to accomplish of this experience of a reality greater than ourselves and move into the, those places. But then when we come back, there's the laundry. There are the diapers. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are the deadlines. There's life and there's the paycheck and there's the rent. <laughs> yep. What do we do then? So that that's again where 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 we are these beings of infinite bliss and potential, and we have to deal with the stuff of everyday life. Yeah, yeah. So, hmm. The essence of the whole thing, though, is just meditation, taking a step back from all of the stories that you told yourself from trauma, childhood, all of the countless narratives that the mind wants to tell you. And just being still and knowing, would you say that is the essence of the whole process? Yes, and because the mind and the brain are not meant to be still. 
And this is one of the great paradoxes of neuroscience. It has been, was for decades, which is that um, when we're at rest, when we're just hanging out on the back porch, sitting there watching the 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 the, the garden, our minds are not still, and our brains are highly active. And the brain consumes 20% of the body's energy, oxygen, its nutrients, all the time. Brain is only 2% of the body's mass, but consumes 20% of its energy. Mm -hmm. And that keeps on going when we're at rest. Now, it makes sense for the brain to consume a lot of energy when we're working on a spreadsheet or composing a poem or we're having a conversation or uh, mowing our lawn. I mean, you have to do stuff. So then the brain you know, should be obviously very highly active. One of the great mysteries of neuroscience for decades was why, when you aren't doing anything at all, is your brain still consuming 20% of the body's resources? Yeah. And the answer is a set of regions called the default mode network. And when we're inactive and not doing a task, our default mode network kicks in. And in a huge study done by two Harvard psychologists, they texted people and they sent them little random reminders throughout the day and they said, what are you doing right now? And how happy you are you? And what they were expecting to find was that when people were, you know, for example, doing tasks at work, they would be kind of stressed and dealing with work. And when they were kicking back on the back porch, they would be happy. They found the opposite. They found that when we were not doing anything, we were usually unhappy when we we're actually engaged in a task, we usually were happy. And so when we're not doing anything, the default mode network kicks on. In some people, in highly creative people, they'll then be dreaming about writing a poem and painting a picture and all the fun things they could do. For most of us, when the default mode network kicks on, we default to thoughts about the past, and this is a reflection on things that hurt us in the past, people that hurt us in the past, and the future, what might hurt us in the future. And so this is a relic, again, of our caveman brain. In my, my book, Mind to Matter, I talk about caveman brain, how caveman brain keeps us stuck in the past and thinking about things in the past. It's just the way the brain was designed to reflect on the tiger that almost ate me yesterday and the tiger that might eat me tomorrow. The tiger that might eat me tomorrow is this threat that might re recur. So the brain defaults to reflecting, ruminating on all the bad stuff. I was talking to a friend of mine this morning, and he is in his 70s and is ruminating on bad stuff that happened 50 years ago. And we just do that. That's the way our brains are designed to do. They're designed to protect us from tomorrow's disaster by reflecting on yesterday's disaster, even though it may be 50 years in the past. So that's the way our brains are inherently designed. And when we try and meditate, our brains then tend to revert back to thinking about stuff from the past or the future. That's what meditation is called monkey mind. So yeah, you try and be still, you try and sit there with your eyes closed. And that was what the spiritual community taught me when I was 15 and 17 years old is sit there, close your eyes, meditate, calm your mind. And the mind is inherently not designed to be still. The default mode network kicks on and I'm consumed by worry and stress. And so what you have to do is deal with that. So I teach EFT acupressure tapping, tapping on acupressure points. That very, very quickly reduces the activity of the default mode network and the emotional brain, the triggered brain. That's the one thing we have to do. Then once we're no longer triggered, we can move into those calm states. Until we're triggered, you tell that refugee to calm down, tell that yeah. veteran or that victim of childhood abuse to mm. just breathe and close their eyes and enter a peaceful state they cannot do it but have them do some tapping have them do some ac acupressure release that stress they're much more easily able to then move into those states so we need both those techniques that allow us to de-stress and those techniques that move us into transcendence mm, that makes a lot of sense and yeah i was actually going to ask you about your tapping method so you're saying First, before being still, we have to take care of the uh, the clutter. 
the clutter of the mind and how we do that <laughs> and how we do that is through somatic practices that alleviate it through the body and your body is yes tapping you can't control through the mind the mind or the mind you have to control through the body and the body gets calm with tapping so that's effective that way yeah somatic practices yeah i don't know too much about tapping i've done a little bit of it actually some of your videos and um i do i do feel calm from it there is uh there's yeah. just something to it. I don't know much about it. Would you be able to explain how that actually like regulates our brain and how it actually affects us at a, at a physiological level? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And there's been a lot of research now over the last 20 years about, about how it affects mood. So people do feel calmer. Anxiety and depression tend to rapidly go away. And uh, the way it works is that when you think about a stressor, a problem, your emotional brain lights up the part of the brain that deals with all those negative intense emotions. So that part of the brain is highly active. And that's the limbic system, which is near the center of your brain, hippocampus, hypothalamus, amygdala. That part of the brain is highly active when you're focusing on a problem, a bad memory, a trauma, a threat. And so when people are focused on those things, that part of the brain is highly active. When they tap, uh, actually just back, back up for a second here, the signal, the memory of the bad thing is activating the emotion. I'm thinking about the car crash. I'm getting upset. I'm thinking about the exam I'm going to face and have to take in a month. I'm getting triggered. I'm focusing on my, my partner being mad at me, and I'm getting upset. So uh, the thought is triggering the emotion. Mm -hmm. And so a signal from the memory part of the brain is triggering activity in the emotional part of the brain. Yeah. So now the emotional brain is getting all lit up. And when you, you tap, the emotional brain gets a second signal that is somatic through the body. And it's the calm. We're regulating these acupressure points, regulating things like cortisol. Cortisol drops precipitously when we tap. Stress genes, inflammatory genes drop in their expression when we tap. So now the body's getting a not different message that says, even though there's this thought from thinking about the car crash, there is now this second signal coming into the emotional brain saying, everything's fine. I, see. I was being chased by a tiger. If I was in the middle of a car crash, I would definitely not be sitting here tapping on my acupressure points. And mm -hmm. it feels kind of good to be regulating my heart rate and my blood pressure and all the physiological shifts that happen when you tap. So it cancels out the stressful thought. And when you break the association between the stressful thought and the emotional brain going into fight or flight, you break that association one time, it stays broken. So we do follow-up studies of people with uh, traumatic experiences. And we find that even three, six months a year later, they no longer respond emotionally to the traumatic memory once that association is break, broken in the brain. So that, that's what it does. It breaks the association between the negative memory or event and going into fight or flight. And we see that on EEGs, MRIs, and other kinds of brain scans. Wow. And yeah, that's awesome that we have the science to back it up. You can actually see the difference. It's not just some kind of Woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's cool we have science, yeah. Uh, but but you know, the, th the thing about it too is that I look at these acupuncture meridian point charts. They're from 2,000 years ago in China. Mm. And we have other evidence for acupuncture being practiced at least 6,000 years ago, far beyond China, actually, in many different parts of the world. Mm. And um, they show these exact same points. So, even, you know, a, a thousand years before we had brain scatters, these pe people knew these points existed and yeah. were using them therapeutically. That's what gets me wondering. How did they know? Right? How did they know? You tell me. How do they know? I, guess, <laughs> I don't you know, have the answer. <laughs> energy sensitive. And they didn't have all the modern technology we had. They only had natural medicine. So they used it to the fullest extent. There's a uh, uh, story in, in India about a, a sage called Susruta, again, 2,000 years ago, who could get so calm in meditation that he was able to trace the blood flows and draw accurate diagrams of 
veins versus arteries, blood going wow. to the heart versus going from the heart. So just stillness, intuition, uh, very, very wise people back yeah, then. Very wise, very wise. Wow, I've never heard that before. That's really cool. You're so still, you can trace your blood. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah. yeah, these people of the past, they had access to some kind of intelligence that we have we have access to that as well it just seems like we lost touch over the years yeah got a little too scientific but it's good that now we're balancing that out we're bringing back this somatic practices with the actual proof that science provides and uh it's a cool time that we live in because all of this stuff is um i was gonna say it's brand new but it's also not it's brand new to the paradigm but it's actually how we used to heal ourselves and how we used to know our body <clears throat> and our whole being before so yeah, amazing times that we live in. I think we spoke about this before we started recording the um, miraculous times we live in. It's this, uh, it's this re, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a rediscovery of what we, what we knew, and we're morphing that with our new technology at the same time. Yes. And I think that's truly how we become like this really this new being, this evolved being. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Would you be able to provide us with an example of how the tapping works and do like a little tapping session here if it doesn't take that much time? Sure, it takes about 10 minutes to do a, a, a quick tap. And what you do is you want to focus on something that happened and that is recent. So you want to pick something that happened in the last, say, two weeks and that you have a measurable emotional response to when you think back to it. So okay. maybe you got an unpleasant piece of news two weeks ago. Maybe you um, two weeks ago or within the last you know few weeks, you got a bad performance review at work, your child, your parent said something to you that was hurtful, a friend of yours let you down, something that, that, that actually occurred. I pick one that really, um, is a single thing that yeah, happened yeah. one this week when the thing. emotion was elicited is what you're saying like when you, when yeah. you really felt it yeah what mm -hmm. elicits the most emotion so mm -hmm. maybe one piece of it is uh slightly emotional and you can measure the emotion on a zero through ten scale zero is no emotion ten is the most possible emotion. So where are you right now? But you want to focus on some measurable small thing and then it's measurable numerically. Like, are you a six out of 10? Are you a seven out of 10? What is your number? And then while you think about that thing, focus intently on that thing, you tap on acupressure points, starting on the side of your hand, tap with three fingers on the side of the other hand and feel yourself breathing. Focus intently on that moment. And while you're focusing on that moment, <clears throat> notice your breathing. Notice you're basically okay right now. You survived that moment. You're still here a few days, weeks, and months later. You're basically okay. Didn't kill you. You didn't die. And you're breathing now. Just take some breaths while you focus intently. I'm tapping here and thinking about that breathing. Tap now on the top of your head, just with your couple of your fingers, middle fingers, tap on the top of your head. Feel your breath. You're breathing. You're okay now. But think about your trigger. Focus intensely on that triggering thing. Keep your eyes open. Focus on the most triggering element. Tap where your eyebrow meets the bridge of your nose with two fingers. Focus on the event. Keep your eyes open, especially if you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't even recommend this at all if you're trying <laughs> you'll, you'll get nice and relaxed so you keep your eyes open tap on the side of your eye with two fingers and keep your eyes open just to keep yourself grounded in the present moment but you're thinking intensely about the event you're feeling it in your body and you're noticing your breathing 
Two fingers tap onto the pupil of your eye on that bone that holds your eye. Feel your breath. Notice you survived. You're still basically okay. Relax your shoulders, relax your neck, relax your head. Keep breathing as you tap and you're focused intently on that bad event. It's real, it happened. Tap onto your nose with two fingers. Feel your breath. Think about that snippet of reality and you survived, you're okay. Tap onto your lower lip. Tap where your collarbone meets your breastbone. Notice that you're breathing. Notice that you came through it. Notice that even though you had this bad experience, you had a high number, it didn't kill you. It's not a threat to your survival. Tap onto your arm, right around your elbow. Just with your open hand is fine. Feel your breath. Tap one more time on the side of your hand. And then to generate some nice slow waves in your brain, relaxation waves, Tap on the back of your hand in the groove between your bones that anchor your ring finger and your little finger. While you tap there, you know, move your eyes around, which generates slow brain waves, delta and theta in your brain. So keep your head steady, look all the way up, look all the way to the right, look all the way down, look all the way to the left, Look all the way up, look all the way to the right. Now reverse the direction, look all the way up again. Feel your breath, really focus on the bad thing. Look all the way to the left. Look all the way down. Look all the way to the right. Look all the way up, think about the bad thing again. And take one last breath and stop tapping and let your eyes go back to neutral. And you've just given your brain a really healthy dose of relaxation. So the chances are your numbers have dropped. We usually have people write down their numbers because they just can't believe there's such a high number. Like I've gone down to maybe, well, I'm just thinking about those numbers and they're just numbers now, 130,000, 100,000. They're just numbers. They aren't laden with emotion to me anymore. So and what what, I, what did you what was your your initial number and your second number gary i'd say seven and now it's two or three two or three yeah yeah so again, we didn't solve the problem we didn't make the past bad thing go away it's just um we've just told our emotional brain that that memory is not a threat to my survival right now and mm -hmm. that is how we work i mean we have people come in for therapy that will list of a hundred events of abuse and uh, trauma and stress in their their lives. And we'll just tap through them one by one, one after the other. And our practitioners are brilliant. They're all highly trained to deal with, with trauma, PTSD. And we find people just shed layer after layer after layer of that trauma. It takes between four and 10 sessions, according to our research to release PTSD and you walk away and the bulk of it's gone. It's so powerful. I mean, I feel the difference right now, just in this moment, but what you're saying is it goes beyond this moment. You take that with you. You take this sense of calm into your life. And that's truly a miracle. If this is true, which I do believe it's true. I just, you know, I'm not in the world. You're in the world and this is your life. So, 
yeah i mean how much um scientific study has been done on this is this uh this is real right <laughs> yeah there are, there are over a hundred clinical trials in English language mm -hmm. journals and other hundred uh, trials because EFT is used all over the world, about 40 million people, another about 200 plus trials in other non-English journals. So Tagalog in the Philippines, a lot of uh, tapping and a lot of research there. Um, Iran, interestingly enough, is using uh, tapping extensively in hospitals. So there are quite a number of clinical trials there for um, tapping for pregnancy, for example, and uh, post-operative stress, pre-operative stress, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research published in, um, uh, in Spanish, in... Um, Uh, and so, a lot, quite a lot, but in German and French. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. been used and practiced all over the world and wow. similar effects are found where it was used. Yeah, that's awesome. You know what it is, is the mind wants to say, it can't be that easy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Just some tapping. <laughs> but I feel it. I feel the difference. The proof is in the pudding of literally how I feel in this direct experience and then also literally in the science. So, yeah, you can't refute that. Yeah. Yeah. That's why usually when I'm like doing a demonstration, so say, for example, I'm doing grand rounds at a hospital, I'll show a brief couple of PowerPoint slides to the doctors and therapists who are in the room and I'll show them the physiology and all the research. And then we get straight into tapping. I have them all tap because they, they, need to see the science, but then they really feel the impact of it when they actually do their first tapping session. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very powerful. So the essence of this whole thing is looking at our brain almost as a computer. That's how I look at it sometimes. It's like a computer. And we have to be able to code ourselves and program ourselves in the correct way because the trauma is almost like um, an un uh, what's the word I'm looking for a unconscious programming that happened to us, right? And what we just have to do is program ourselves back into the state of um, peace, happiness. But it's through the body, right? I think that's what we're getting at here. It's like you actually have to utilize your body. It's all one thing. It's not like this is the mind and then this is the body. It's like this is all one divine system and if you know how to utilize your nervous system in the right way you're able to become anew and from this conversation and from my personal experiences as well it's actually a lot simpler than we make it out to be you know it's through these old ancient somatic exercises that somehow they figured out and if you just incorporate them it doesn't even take that much time it seems right through the tapping method what what was that 10 minutes 10 minutes a day it was about 10 minutes to... i was timing it it was a little less yeah yeah so that's that's truly mind-boggling to me and then also practices like yoga um acupuncture and i don't know there's a lot of different practices but at the end of the day i guess my point is like if this is actually very accessible for all of us to be able to do this and become a new essentially and to evolve into something new and um yeah i guess you just have to you just have to do it, right? You just have to figure out that these practices are real, first of all, and then and just do it. I think that's what the problem with a lot of us is we just don't do it. We might not believe it. Like I said before, it can't be that easy. But if you do maybe have a little bit of faith and you do it, you come to find out like, wow, this is, this is it. The yogis are onto something. Yeah, I, I wish it were difficult and expensive because that'd, that'd be really rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the thing but unfortunately you know it's, it's uh it's just so easy i've i've a psychiatrist friends who just chuckle and said one of them said dawson you know your your stuff is so quick and easy our stuff is so hard and difficult and expensive and and uh, we're paid a fortune and you aren't and so uh but it is yeah. it's really you know it's it's free i mean all of our stuff's free on the web just go to our, our website you can download the free mini manual you can download free meditations watch our videos uh, just tons of stuff there that's free there is stuff you have to pay for if you want to go work with a therapist or a practitioner you have to pay them but again you'll get far 
further ahead in your personal journey, if you're working with somebody who knows these these techniques, I mean, mm-hmm. four to 10 sessions for PTSD, that's not a big investment of time or money to uh, hire a practitioner and then go and really get those results quickly yourself. So um, yeah, the, 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 these, these things are out there. What's so cool to me too is like in Africa, I mean, Rwanda, for example, Rwanda, there was this absolutely mind-bogglingly horrendous genocide in 1994. And literally a million people were hacked to death with machetes in this intertribal warfare. It was just one of the most, uh, it was a Holocaust. Um, And yet tapping came through Rwanda and teams of volunteers, including people I know and people who we trained, went, began going to, to Rwanda around 1998, 1999, about, about four or five, six years after the, the, the events there, and then kept on going there and still occasionally go there. And they found these kids in orphanages and they were just being warehoused. I mean, all these people have been killed. The, the, a lot of the young kids had escaped and um, they were just, they had no parents. They were just being stored in warehouses, these, these orphanages and um, very, very poor. And they were taught tapping. Thousands of them were taught tapping. And suddenly the nightmares went away and the flashbacks went away and they became, the bedwetting went away and the involuntary twitching and ticks went away and they became functional again. And it spread throughout many of those orphanages. And um, I don't know, you know, we don't know for sure how much that contributed to Rwanda's recovery from the, 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 the Holocaust there. But um, it it may have made some contribution, and so we in, in these world's trouble spots. Like right now, we're we're training people in Ukraine, uh, people in EFT Universe, my organization. We're training therapists in Ukraine. There's a Ukrainian Telegram channel to train therapists in EFT, and they're using this with people who are in the middle of. I just got a list from one colleague a couple of days ago saying, "Okay, Dawson, we need." help with um, sirens. There are sirens all the time, not just the sound of the bombs when they explode, but there are sirens all the time. And the sirens now have become so triggering to people. Can you help with that? So they give me lists of things they want to work with there. And we obviously, as a human species, need to end war. We need to end violence. We need to end um, discrimination. We need to end demonization of, of other other groups, divisiveness, but um, we need to end these things in ourselves first. We first do it, then we offer it to other people, and then then it spreads. And EFT is like that. It is so simple that it's now used by, we estimate, over 40 million people worldwide. So the answer is right here, and it is reducing stress now on a, a fairly large scale. Is it uh, widespread enough, not even close. We need to get into, into every hospital, every school, every prison, every company, every every workspace, every team, but it is making inroads and making a small but significant change to the, the overall state of the human race. Mm, yeah, I think we all need it a little bit right now, <laughs> or a lot of it. Hmm. But still, just the fact that you have 40 million, that's a very, very big number. That's awesome. Now it's 40 million in one. <laughs> <laughs> and after yeah. the thousandth download of the podcast, it'll be 41 40 yeah, exactly. million, thousand and <laughs> one. So, yeah. <laughs> and then, like you said, it just spreads like a wildfire. Yeah. Now, do you feel like um, after we do sort out our own stuff, stuff of the mind, the clutter, as I said before, that there is this subtle obligation to give back a little bit. Like, you know how much it helped you, so you kind of have to share the love, spread the love a little bit. You know what I mean? Because like you said, you're not getting rich off of this, but there's something in you that um, pulls you toward sharing this practice and, and spreading the message. So do you feel that within your being? I think we move to a point where we we know it's easy to release a lot of human suffering. And so we're motivated to see people not suffer. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's some kinds of suffering that are inescapable, but a lot of psychological suffering is easily 
remedied. And so we want to see people get better. We want to see our friends and family get better. We want to see people we know and love get better. And so there's that impulse to, to connect. And we human beings are wired for, for compassion. We're wired for connection. We have special neurons in, in our brains called von Economo neurons. And they're only present in the brains of a few species that are highly social. So whales have them and elephants have them and dolphins have them and monkeys and apes have von Economo neurons. Only a very few species have them. And these are the social species. We have them. And so we're naturally attuned to other people. We have mirror neurons that light up when I see my friend upset, those mirror neurons fire in my brain and I feel empathy. And so um, that's a natural function, feature of the human brain is to share in feelings. There are also communal shared feelings. I mean, there's, we mentioned about the election, the sense of shared grief. So again, there's that, there's that, 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 that global field. Um, Teilhard de Chardin was a great Jesuit philosopher of the 1950s, and he called it the noosphere or the psychosphere. Mm. There, there's this planetary consciousness that is there. And Carl Jung talked about the collective consciousness and the collective unconscious. And so um, we are part of that whole. And whatever we are individually putting forth is entering that whole. So I sit here in meditation. I think, what can I do? There's this Holocaust and mass slaughter happening in Gaza with this absolutely you know, bloodthirsty Israeli leader who's simply indiscriminately slaughtering tens of thousands of civilians, uh, dropping 2,000-pound bombs. So I don't even know a 2,000-pound bomb. I, I own a, a Sprinter, a great big RV, and it's carrying capacity, the weight of this massive... 24 foot long vehicle is 2000 pounds. So it's like mm. that, that big a bomb hitting uh, a home. Uh, and we're, we're, we in the U S are supplying the bombs, this bloodthirsty guy uh, leading a bloodthirsty group of other people uh, doing the executions is, is dropping them on innocent civilians in Gaza. So what can I do about that? I can't do much. I can train people. I've been, we have wonderful volunteers and practitioners in Israel, in Palestine, and they're they're doing what they can, but here I am. What do I do? I can work on my own inner state. I can be peace in myself. As Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see. How, where am I angry? Where am I intolerant? Where am I making war in my thoughts on other people? And how can I release that tension? So we can learn to be that. And when we do that, we are into the psychosphere of the planet, the the, the aggregate of all consciousness on, on Earth. We are we are allowing the, the peace in our hearts to flow into that. Am I affecting Gaza directly? No. Am I making some minuscule change to the psychosphere? Absolutely. When, when a million people are doing that, and in my new book, Spiritual Intelligence, I talk about the Center for Disease Control numbers of the percentage of the population in the U.S. who's meditating. The numbers throughout the Western world are that about 1% of people were meditating in 1980. So one out of every 100 people were meditating in 1980. Today, it's about 20%, one in five Wow. We've had a massive increase in the number of people who are putting out those energies of love, of compassion, of kindness, of gratitude, of wholeness, of joy. So this, again, is producing a shift in, in the whole. And that's why we're seeing all these acts of compassion along with the acts of brutality that are going on in our world today. Mm, yeah. Yeah, well said. It uh, not only allows one to be... Um, some kind of functioning beacon of light that hopefully affects the noosphere in some way. Maybe it does. I believe it does. But also on a personal level, the whole spiritual path and all these modalities and practices allow one to be in the world and not of it, as Jesus said. You know, it's like you got all the craziness going on, the circus of the outside world. It allows us to deal with it. Like despite the goings on, we are able to find the peace within. So it's a win-win. It's like it might affect this sort of collective unconsciousness, but 
really what's important is it affects your consciousness right here right now and uh yeah that's the beauty of this thing is it's like nobody and nothing can hold you back it's true sovereignty in how we feel through these practices it's like there's really nothing that can affect you at the end of the day if you know how to practice in the right way and to incorporate these things into your life and that's true power that's true power really it's like a sense of invulnerability it's not like this the stuff's gonna obviously shit's gonna happen in our life i'm not saying that i'm not trying to bypass we still gotta like you said do the laundry pay the bills put food on the table but there's like a it's like a renewal on how we live and how we express ourselves here it's like it, we don't let the darkness get to us you know the ones that are on this wavelength the one in five as you said i feel like it's even more to be honest with you it's still impressive one in five but i don't know it's probably only increasing as time goes on but um yeah the, the special ones that are on that wavelength are um i don't know it's like we're we're paving the way for some kind of new new world in the world and not of it it's like what well, while we're still while we're still um sort of at the whim of uh of babylon <laughs> we are paving the way to zion in the biblical sense and uh, that all starts point of my story that all starts within it all starts within us in all of our personal circumstances and karma and that's the beauty of people like you you're enabling and enabling us to um have this this freedom in our life despite the craziness right because a lot of us we feel as though we're we're trapped we're, we're entrapped in this world you know it's unfortunate i wish more people could know how simple it was i mean it is how simple it is to be able to to really feel this in their life and have it not just be some strange woo woo that people talk about on the internet to really incorporate it into your life and feel the difference because it's real and that's the only way that i guess um you become a believer is you do it right you actually do it and you find out that it's real so the only thing we have to do now i guess is just spread the good word that's what i'm trying to do and that's what you're doing it seems and uh it may seem bleak the world may seem a little uh dark at this point but behind the scenes i think what's really going on is a revolution of consciousness right it's not going to really be covered on fox news or cnn particularly <laughs> <laughs> but if you know who to tune into where to tune into you'll be able to see that there is something going on and the revolution will not be televised so yeah on that note um that's it i i think that might be a good note to wrap this up at do you have anything you want to say to that any last words that you want to get off your chest before we wrap it up yeah i want to quote you gary okay <laughs> <laughs> and earlier you said we have to do it we have that's to it. put it in practice mm -hmm. and that's what i want each of those listening to reflect on as you're listening to gary and i now i challenge you to put it into practice and we'll give you some resources i have a website where it will send you there's a downloadable meditation track there and my challenge to you is to download that free track. It's called Eco Meditation, ECO Meditation, and do it for 30 days. Just devote 30 days to doing it first thing in the morning. Wake up. It's about 20 minutes long. Use that track. That track has been shown in MRI and EEG studies to produce rapid regulation of your stress. And in 30 days, a landmark clinical trial showed that that track produces anatomical change to your brain, quieting down the stress centers and amplifying the activity of the compassion and gratitude centers of your brain. So that happens in, in a month. So do that in a month. Do it for just 30 days straight. And you'll one thing, you'll feel different from day one in all likelihood. You will feel the shift in your body. You'll be doing some tapping. You'll be doing a bunch of other things, but you'll feel start to feel really good from day one. You'll then keep on doing it for a month, and then you'll find you'll shift from that point on. So just make it a practice, make it a habit in your life to feel good, to feel kind to yourself by meditating and creating that space for yourself in, in your own life. So that's, that's the thing to do. Practice mm -hmm. that simple technique of tapping and meditation feel good and then you'll notice 
your life will start to change. Those feel-good feelings will move out from your individual um, close experience into the world around you, and you'll feel dramatically better, and then you'll see things shift around you as well. So that's the challenge to you. Put it into practice. Love yourself enough to let go of all the excuses you have for why you have to keep on doing your life the way you have. Embrace the possibility that you can release those things that hold you back and then be that glorious, vibrant human being. That's why you showed up here. You did not come to earth. You are not, you did not, you, you as consciousness did not pick up a body and have an incarnation in order to do the laundry and think negative thoughts and obsess about your past. <laughs> you came here to create and dance and, and have a joyful experience every day. That's your birthright. And you have mm -hmm. tons of hardware in your brain for that as well as for stress. So the challenge is to shut down the stress network, open what I call in my book, Spiritual Intelligence, turn on what's called the enlightenment network and then again your entire brain function shifts with it your cells with it your genes with it your neural firing and then with all of those things your life so just go out there and put that into practice mm -hmm. beautiful just do it <laughs> seriously well i thank you for coming on here dr church this was an awesome awesome experience went by really quick. I feel like we just touched the tip of the iceberg. So if you ever want to tap in again and have another conversation, I feel like we could have another great talk. But until then, I wish you all the best and keep doing your thing. Bless peace you. Love. Joy. Thank you. For sure. And uh, yeah, peace and love to everybody that listened this long as well. We're going to be all right, y'all. Peace.